Welcome back to the Trying Again podcast. I'm Rachel Smith. If this is your first time with me, you're very welcome. Feel free to go back to episode one to hear the background to why I'm here talking about miscarriage. The conversations in this episode will be frank and they may be difficult. I never thought I'd have kids again. Never thought I'd have all pregnant again or carry through to full term. I kind of thought, what's the point? Um, but we took stop and we thought, right, let's do one last one last bash of this. Let's 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 go. Let's let's do this and that will be it. If this doesn't work, then that's it. The end. But they are needed. It's quite common in in pregnancy after loss for it for the sort of the anxiety to kind of come back with a vengeance. It's quite a sort of common pattern. For those who've been with me on this journey, you will know the time without any living children. That rainbow baby stalk hasn't arrived for me just yet. And I'm taking the time to decide whether I want to try again following multiple miscarriages. So this episode really is an eye-opener for me. In this episode, I'll be looking at what it is like to go full term after loss. Selfishly, I want to know if I do get there, what can I expect? Let me introduce you now to Anjali Patel, which is not her real name, but the one that Anjali feels comfortable to share her story with. I think this is probably the first time that I've I'm being I'm telling someone else other than my husband. Um we had our loss in first loss in October twenty fifteen. Um it was an early loss at around eight weeks. And that was after three and a half years of trying. And then three weeks later, three or four weeks later, um, I experienced my first loss. Um and it was really hard. Uh we took a break and then we did our first um, fertility treatment. We did um, IVF, um, and unfortunately, that then ended in a mis- miscarriage at, at around ten weeks. But I had the initial scan, and they said, "Okay, you've lost the baby." And then, you know, there's no heartbeat, and that that's heart wrenching in itself. And then having to wait a week before they, you know, carried out the procedure. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm carrying my child, but my child's no longer living. Um, and that, that was for me, that was, that was really, really hard. Um, so we decided to take, um, a longer break this time. Um, and then in February 2017, I went for another round of IVF. And shortly after they transferred the embryo, um, I, I felt quite ill. Um, but I didn't, I didn't think anything of it. I just thought, oh, it's a bad stomach bug. And then I had the bleed and I thought, oh, I've had my period. I felt a bit sore, but I thought, do you know what? It's just the IVF treatment, soldiered on, even helped my husband with the women's self-defense class. And then I thought, no, something's wrong because six weeks had then passed and I hadn't had a period and my stomach was ballooning as if there's no tomorrow. So I thought, well, let me do a pregnancy test. And it came back positive, which was weird because the IVF clinic said there's there's no you know, the IVF cycle had essentially failed. And then, yeah, so this is why, well, okay, so it's positive test. So we went back to the IVF clinic. They ran some bloods and they were like, yep, yeah, you're, you're, you're definitely pregnant. Um, but your, uh, hormone levels aren't what they should be for someone who's say 10 weeks or 11 weeks pregnant. Long story short, we eventually got a scan a week or two later. And that confirmed that I'd actually had an ectopic pregnancy. Um, so I had an emergency laparoscopy and what they found was the embryo that had gone back into my uterus had actually decided to go walk about. So it went from my right, went up my right fallopian tube and it came out the other end and decided it was going to implant on my right ovary. That, that was really, I think that was probably for me, that was probably one of the hardest things physically for me to go through it was really really tough I then fell pregnant naturally um, three months after my ectopic and that resulted in a missed miscarriage and then yeah, it doesn't get any better unfortunately <laughs> in IVF we had we decided to go through another round of IVF and that again resulted in a chemical pregnancy by which point I was absolutely completely deflated I never thought I'd have kids again never thought I'd have all pregnant again or carry through to full term. I kind of thought, what's the point? Um, but we, we took stop and we thought, right, let's do one last, 
one last bash of this. Let's 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 go. Let's let's do this, and that will be it. If this doesn't work, then that's it. The end. We did three IVF cycles essentially back to back over the course of six months. We decided to transfer that one viable embryo, and I carried through to full term. And our son Ethan was born in um, October last year, and he's a perfectly happy, healthy child. Um, and I never thought we'd get to this point. It, it's yeah, it's it's been tough, and obviously the emotional stuff that goes with it, mm. physical stuff that goes with it. I've, I think I've probably before I even had Ethan, I'd put on an extra stone due to the IVF treatments and the eating shed loads of ice cream and chocolate because I felt <laughs> sorry for myself. Mm -hmm. No, um, I, I get that. <laughs> so I've lost the weight. I'm still in my maternity stuff 10 months on. And then obviously, you know, we, we've got a large extended family. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm British Asian by background. We've got a large extended family. So, you know, over the last, you know, over the 10 years that it took us to, to essentially have Ethan, we've had people get married, have one kid, two kids. And it's just a constant people asking you questions of when you're going to have a baby. Mm -hmm. And then people stop asking. When you when you respond rudely and say it's none of your business, <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, especially within the Asian community, um, it's it's almost like, oh, you're married, or oh, when are you going to have a kid? Almost straight away. I think, I guess in any community, not just not just the Asian community, but um, you know, people do ask questions, and I think I think they shouldn't. Um, I mean, they wouldn't ask a man that question, mm -hmm. um, really. So yeah, I mean, it's it's been really hard. Um, and I, this is not something I would wish on anyone to go through, um, ever. I mean, not even my worst enemy, even if I did have any enemies, I wouldn't, I wouldn't wish that on them. It's, it's, it's been really hard, really hard. And your decision to say this is our last time, how did you feel and how did that come about that you would, that, well, one, you've built yourself up after so many losses to say, actually, yes, I'm going to do this again. But then also, this is it. And then this is the last time I'm doing it again. How did that settle with you? Yeah, so um, that that was a really hard decision for us to take because um, just before we took that decision, um, I think we, we were both myself and my husband, we were both at a point where we were like, this isn't going to happen, is it? This isn't going to happen. And then we actually took a step back and thought and worked through it logically. So took the emotion out of it almost. So we came to the, we came to the decision that look, every time we've had an IVF cycle, essentially I've, I've fallen pregnant, even if it was for a very short amount of time. Let's give this one last go because we can't keep doing this anymore. So let, let, let's, let, let's give it one last chance. And if it doesn't work, we'll look into other options or we'll just, you know, we, we just won't have children. Um, and that, as I said, that was a really hard decision to take. It, it, yeah, it, we just, we just came to that conclusion because we thought we can't go on anymore, but we've got the funds. We can't take money with us and we die. Mm. Let's, let's just, let's just, do it one last time it was just we just didn't want to leave any stone unturned and we hadn't done any testing on our embryos beforehand in, in our previous IVF cycles so we just thought we trusted our clinic and we just thought well okay let's let, let's just do this let's just let's just go for it one last time when you were coping with the grief and you found out you were pregnant with Ethan how was that feeling when you'd got past your little hurdles you know when you'd got past the 12 weeks see unfortunately what happened was we found out we were pregnant with Ethan and then it was also our 10 year wedding anniversary so we were looking to go away two days before we were due to fly um I had a severe bleed and I was passing things I didn't recognize so I thought oh here we go another miscarriage and I cried and cried literally non-stop until the scan and then luckily the scan showed that everything was okay we were me especially I was very very anxious to the point where I would continue every time I go to the toilet I'd be like yes no bleed and, and that kind of continued that that anxiety continued 
until maybe I was about 20, 25 weeks when we slowly started to tell people. And I was just anxious throughout my entire pregnancy. Hmm. Um, I mean, I was happy, obviously, that I had a baby on the way after all that we'd been through. But it was just, honestly, it was just constant anxiety and lots of ups and downs as well. Like some days I'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, look, I've got a bump. And there'll be other days I'm like, oh, I feel like really scared. Mm. Um, so there are a lot of ups and downs, and I guess hormones don't help either. Um, and I just kind of almost threw myself into my work, so I just carried on working and carried on just, you know, plodding along as I normally would, just to kind of almost while away the months, just just to make sure that. Yeah, I can get through. But once you, so once we'd passed, I think it's a 25, where the 25 or the 26 week mark where a pregnancy is able to, a baby's able to survive outside the womb was when I started to, my anxiety started to decrease a little. So I thought, even if I have the baby now, it's okay. Hopefully the baby will live. Um, we we had a couple of scares during the pregnancy. So obviously the one I'd mentioned, then we had another scare around 25 weeks where they couldn't detect a heartbeat. Um, it's because the midwife's machine decided it wasn't working. Oh, wow. Yeah, so yeah, well, that's great. I mean, they had no, no fetal heartbeat scrawled across my maternity notes. And oh, my That's Lord. scary in itself. Um, and that, that was quite scary. Yeah, it was, it, it was a very anxious pregnancy in a nutshell. And that's really sad, isn't it? Because when we grow up, we don't get told this. You don't get told that actually, you know, you get told that you're going to be pregnant and everything's lovely. And, you know, there'll be baby showers and all these things. And actually that what you've described of you, you're feeling anxious, it's, it's made me feel a little bit nervous <laughs> when you're done. <talking. Yeah. laughs> and it, and it, so it, it, I get that. And it's not what you're told, is it? It's not what, as a society, we're told as women is going to happen when, when you have a baby. And, um, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I didn't have a baby show. Just, I was just too anxious. I didn't want to jinx it. Was your family wanting to then? No, um, my family were like, oh, it's entirely up to you. And you were completely, yeah, they were really understanding, to be fair. Um, they're like, oh, you know, you don't, you don't have to have one if you don't want to. You don't. And I'm like, I mean, my sister in law asked me, I've had friends ask me, you're not having a baby show. Oh, I can organize it for you. And, you know, oh, I'll do everything. You have to do a thing. You have to lift a finger. And I'm like, <laughs> I know, and that's a lovely thought. And I really appreciate, you know, appreciate the offer, but just decided against it. Part of me just wanted to get through the pregnancy and have a happy, healthy baby at the mm. end of it. And I know, obviously, having a baby shower or not doesn't, there's no correlation between the two. But I think for me, I just wanted no fuss. Yeah. And um, also in my, in my culture, they have this, um, you know, when you when you're when you get to say six to seven months, they have this ceremony, and also just it's a bit like an Indian baby shower, but with a priest thrown in. So the priest basically blesses the that the, the, it's like a little ceremony thing. It takes five minutes, and then you get all dressed up in the sari, and it's all nice and lovely, and there's lots of food, and you know you ask all your family to come over, and there's lots of like Indian sweets flying about, and that kind of thing. And my mom was like, have one. And I'm like, I don't want it. I don't, I don't want that fuss. And my husband was like, well, you know, if you can have, if you want to have it, have it. We'll do, we'll do it small, just immediate family only. And, you know, you, you can have whatever you want, however you want it. We don't even need, we don't even have to have a priest. You can just do it, you know, just like, you know, and I'm like, no. And my husband was like happy with that straight away, although my mum took some convincing that I didn't want one. Um, and she goes, but why? Why? And I was like, well, because I've miscarried before. And she goes, oh, no, it's okay. I went, no, I just, I just don't want it. And in the end, what we did was we ended up just taking both sets of parents when I was at that six, seven month mark going to the temple and just offering um like some a small box of Indian sweets at the temple and then we went out to a nice Indian restaurant afterwards for dinner and for me that was perfect just no fuss and and I was anxious I was a ball of stress as it was with the pregnancy I just Mm. didn't want any extra stress and 
for me, that was what I wanted. Is there anything you wish you knew before at the start of all your journey? Is there anything you wish that you knew then? Yeah, I think a few things, actually. Um, One is I wish I'd known that this is only temporary. And I know that sounds really obvious, but the losses and the time that we were trying was temporary. And just because you think your life is going one way, if it goes, if it's going to go on another, that doesn't matter. That's something you have to deal with. And there's no point worrying about it in between, if that makes sense. Mm. Because I got to a point when I was in the midst of it where I thought, I'm never going to get through this. And all I could focus on was getting pregnant or why can't I get pregnant or why can't I carry a baby through to full term. What I wish I'd known is if you can't do that, it's okay. It's perfectly fine to have these feelings, but you need to work through them. And I honestly wish I'd known that then because it's very easy to lose sight of sight of things when you're in that situation and I wish I'd also known at the time that I needed to work through my feelings a bit better so I wish I'd known that it's okay to have crappy days it's okay to have days when you feel inadequate and not to beat yourself up about it I just wish I'd known that because I got got so bogged down in um, what kind of woman am I and and also what I would have known is, at the time when I was going through it, another thing is to ignore people. When people make comments and ask you, just ignore them. Or come up with fantastic ways of things, of fantastic things to say in response. I just wish I'd known that because I'd get so upset by comments, insensitive comments people would make or ask me insensitively when I'm going to have a child. That I just wish... But it's so easy to say that now from where I'm standing. But when you're in the midst of it, it's difficult. But I just wish I would have known that at the time. I wish someone would have just sat down and told me these things. This is an area of unknown for me. I feel a little bit like a child. I feel like I'm not ready. And then I am ready. And then I may never be ready. Hearing from Anjali really has helped me, but I didn't stop there. You may remember from my chat in episode four, and spoiler alert, Jenny Ag shared with me that she was pregnant again after loss. I kind of had this idea that if I got beyond 12 weeks, I'd feel a lot more relaxed. And that there's, a, there's an element of that, but I definitely haven't completely relaxed, if that makes sense. Mm. But the first, those first 12 weeks were really tough, like the hardest of all. I think in terms of like the mental load, I think it's got harder each time, like, which isn't to say that it's easy that, you know, after one miscarriage at all, like I think it's, but it definitely builds. You just expect to be bleeding every time you go to the loo and that sort of thing. I still, I still haven't really shaken that even now. I caught up with Jenny to see how things went with her pregnancy. Edward will be eight weeks old tomorrow, so two months old basically, which is... I, I can't I, my, my brain doesn't understand how that's even possible basically <laughs> I don't know where the the time has gone um but yeah I'm feeling I'm feeling pretty good um certainly a lot better than I did in the sort of final uh kind of final month or so of pregnancy I would say um when I was really struggling uh, yeah, so it's been, it's been, it hasn't been easy, but it has been very enjoyable at the same time. And um, why were you struggling? I think I, well, I've since been told that it, it's quite normal, um, for sort of pregnancy anxiety to, particularly in people who've had previous losses, whether that's a miscarriage or, um, a later loss. Um, for the kind of anxiety that was really intense at the beginning in the sort of first trimester perhaps um to resurge in the kind of final few weeks and um yeah it took me a bit by surprise um and my, my you know I was very anxious the whole time I was I, and I don't know why that would be I'd not really anticipated it either because I think for me I'd always thought not that it would be 
plain sailing, you know, once we've got to a 12 week scan, which we'd never got to before. But I did think that, you know, once I was very visibly pregnant, once I could feel the baby moving, once, you know, we'd got past, once we were at full term, because, you know, anything after 37 weeks counts as term. And, you know, if they arrive, then they, there's no sort of issue of prematurity or anything. I'd kind of assumed that those weeks would be the easiest weeks. And actually, I, I didn't find that at all. Um, I, yeah, I found myself very anxious about what might happen in labour and what, how much could still go wrong. And um, yeah, so I think there was there was a lot of that going on, um, which, and obviously you still have anxieties with a newborn, but for me anyway, I've it, it has been a, a much more manageable. How did you manage that um, anxiety and stress, or, or did you? A few ways, really. I I kind of really went into, um, I mean, you probably know this better than most. I just I really went into a bit of a, a bubble, and I I kind of I I stopped, I stopped work earlier than I'd intended, um, uh, and really just you know focused on feeling okay and just kind of managing my emotions. I did, I did lots of the sort of sensible things that you know are often recommended for anxiety sort of boring self-care things like lots of walks and um yoga a a friend um an instagram friend i've never met them in real life who um does uh she does hypnobirth teaching um and she's also had um losses of her own and she very kindly i think i mentioned that i was feeling very anxious one day on instagram and she um sent me some sort of meditate like a guided meditation um calming affirmations for pregnancy after loss which is normally the word affirmation makes me feel a bit you know makes kind of things jump up inside me it doesn't doesn't feel sit right with me at all but actually it's not my kind of thing but it was it really it really helped. I did that a lot in the last kind of couple of weeks. And actually I used it a little bit during birth as well. And it's tricky because I think everybody else around you thinks that, I think they think, well, you know, you're going to be fine now um, because you're so, you know, you're so nearly there um, and everyone's very excited for you, which is, is lovely. Um, but it feels quite, uh, there's quite a contrast, I think, between how, the sort of excitement that's building for everyone around you and your kind of loved ones and and how you perhaps feel on the inside because this is your first pregnancy isn't it so how how would you know how to cope with it when you've not been there before and then you'd like to say you, you are carrying that um the memories around alongside whatever you know appointments you've got or midwives chatting to you or doctors saying whatever they're saying you still have your memories and your experiences that you're bringing into that room and it it kind of seems to fall I don't know if it's different for other kinds of um baby loss but for me certainly although I was being seen um by a consultant or by the consultant team um because of our history perhaps unlike with um and for you know for good medical reasons I'm, I'm sure um the sort of that that kind of um thought on your your history of, of repeat miscarriages seems to fall by the wayside like I think it's kind of see because it's medically irrelevant um or I, I think that's how it's it's seen for, for lots of people um particularly for us where there's no known medical cause um you know the assumption is your pregnancy will be a healthy one so I think perhaps whereas before in the earlier weeks um when they're perhaps more bearing that in mind when they see you um and you know I was taking progesterone and there were sort of things relating to our 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 history of loss that were kind of at the forefront of those appointments by the time you're I was at sort of 35 plus weeks I mean maybe even earlier it's just not um occasionally I would say if I was having a scan um or you know perhaps a midwife would would spot it on my notes but it 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 they're not thinking about it I mean maybe they just don't want to remind you um maybe they just assume you're anxious anyway but it doesn't seem to be 
kind of included in the sort of holistic kind of your care I guess so I think you feel quite alone with with carrying that and those memories and perhaps not everyone you see is is thinking that that's where you're coming from from my point of view that's really interesting because I almost feel like because you've gone through it I'd be more prepared because you've told me this if that if that makes sense because I would not have thought that that would happen so that's really interesting for me if I ever get to that point then I can think oh you know Jenny's had that so I would maybe wouldn't feel as alone yeah I mean I think that's really true I um another another Instagram friend someone I've never met but you know you have a similar story Mm. mentioned uh mentioned this to me they messaged and they said um you know I felt exactly the same way and they were they said that they'd been seeing a psychologist um throughout their pregnancy after loss and they were told by the the um the the therapist that actually it's quite common in in pregnancy after loss for it for the sort of the anxiety to kind of come back with a vengeance it's quite a sort of common pattern and while obviously everybody is different there is definitely something I found that quite comforting in a way although it didn't necessarily make the anxiety go away there's something very comforting about knowing that you know this is a sort of normal reaction how do you think you've changed as as you having Edward or or have you changed I know when I was trying to conceive and you know feeling sort of very much on the outside of of motherhood and wanting to be a mother it's something that comes up a lot isn't it it's like oh you know you're whether it's people talking about that sort of loss of identity that comes with having children um or you know the the old kind of oh you can't possibly understand until until you have a baby um yeah so it's a good I don't know what my my expectations were really um perhaps because I think think sometimes the comments people would make about sort of the changes that happen to you the sort of transformation that comes with being a mother I was always a bit perhaps a bit hurt by it and perhaps therefore a little sceptical and wondering if you know this is just um I mean it obviously does change absolutely everything but I don't feel like a completely different person I think that's you know in some respects it's a bit of a relief you know you no longer have to having to be completely uh, or quite so vigilant about what you're eating you can have the drink again um I mean those are very trivial things but Mm it's kind of it's a nice kind of reclaiming of of your autonomy I think (laughs) um I would never tell anybody that it's all been a complete breeze and I think there is definitely a pressure to um you know when you when what you wanted for so long is a baby um and you've been so vocal about that as I have been Mm. (laughs) um I think there is definitely a pressure um to act or to be seen to be enjoying absolutely every single moment um and that's just just not realistic is it I mean in any in any kind of um with anything in life that you you really want and you you get you are never going to be nothing is ever completely perfect and plain sailing and um enjoyable every second of the day um don't get me wrong there's huge amounts to enjoy um with having him here he is the best thing just Mm. the best thing um but it's also very difficult that doesn't change I think just because I mean I think we hear quite a lot about how how difficult um the baby years are from women I think that's and that was always something that I that jarred with me when I was kind of writing set out writing um about writing our story there's I felt you know I've heard endlessly about how difficult um certain things can be in motherhood or you know how lonely those sort of newborn um or kind of young baby years can be and yet there's you know you feel like why don't we hear about the other side of it so much Mm. um why isn't that in the mainstream too because it is incredibly mainstream lots of people had said um to us I don't know whether it was kind of people on the midwives on the ward or or family members you know they sort of warned us that you know that first night at home with the newborn kind of once everybody's gone once you're discharged from hospital once you're on your own um that that will be the longest night of your life 
you know kind of having to realizing that you have you're you're on your own you have to look after um this tiny person and the kind of the anxiety and that comes with that i i mean while there have been incredibly anxious moments throughout with edward it's not i have to say it doesn't it hasn't been a patch on the sort of anxiety of pregnancy for for us and dan did say you know perhaps we didn't get that sort of real hit of realization and this is our first night with him and oh my god what do we do and what have we done and all those kind of doubts and worries and didn't really hit in the same way and I think as Dan said you know our threshold for anxiety is probably quite high at this point um and there's a lot more information with having a baby an actual baby that you have to look after you know it's like can you they tell you uh sort of things that you can monitor and check and um you know have they have they had this many wet nappies or are they doing this or are they doing that and if they have a rash does it look like this or whatever it is there's a sort of there are things you can check and see objectively with your eyes when you're pregnant you 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 know apart from being able to feel them move which again is a is a sort of can be quite tricky to monitor um yeah i don't know there's 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 it's there there are less unknowns i suppose for me and so in a way that's been a huge um positive i think that perhaps other people don't appreciate in the same way perhaps for them the pregnancy is the fun part and having the baby is the, the the terrifying part and it yeah it's been the balance has been slightly different for us i think and i i appreciate this we're great it can be quite hard to hear those stories sometimes when you're sort of in the thick of it and i know i definitely felt that you know everybody was getting their rainbow baby but me um but yeah i just hope that it is a hopeful story i think it is i think it is but uh, yeah <laughs> Oh, bless him. Um, <laughs> right. I'll let um, you go. Yes, right. I feel very privileged to have had these conversations. Anjali and Jenny navigated their feelings and emotions themselves and paved the way for people like me to learn from. I wouldn't say I'm feeling any less anxious at the thought of getting past 12 weeks if I do decide to try again. What I think it has helped me with is knowing that I will need to prepare myself for the fallout of getting past 12 weeks. That either side of the coin It's likely to be a difficult path that is rocky and full of emotion and that I need to be very mindful of it. It makes my preparation of lifestyle and choices more important now to ensure that if I do go down that path, I'm in the best possible place to carry a baby full term. This episode is recorded and produced by me in my spare room in my duvet den. The music is Small Bump by Ed Sheeran. Thank you to Anjali Patel, the Miss Couch Association and Jenny Ag from the Uterus Monologues. If you're going through it right now and you need some support, there's links to help available on the website tryingagainpodcast.com. If you like this episode, please share it or leave a review on your podcast app so that others can find it. And if you haven't already, remember to subscribe to this podcast so that you don't miss an episode. You can wrap your fingers round my thumb and hold